Okay, this game is Time Nord vs. Nidorf, played in the Zurich tournament of 1953, which was famously annotated by Bronstein. Now, Time Nord plays um, d4, knight f6 was played, which was, at the time, it was quite innovative to play the king's engine defence. Usually they were just playing standard queen's gamut declines or accepted. So this was quite a dynamic system for the time, which... Um, Bronstein commentator is becoming quite a workhorse of an opening, rich in sort of new territory and new ideas. So this is the main Lion King's engine defence, where Black plays knight c6, provokes this uh, closing of the centre, and now unblockades the f pawn. So Black's now going to have a pawn storm on the king's side, and White's usually trying to gain a lot of space on the queen's side and undermine Black's pawn structure. The undermining point usually being d6. Um, peeling open the c file as the usual plan here. But Black's uh, plan's got a bonus that White's King's on the King's side. So you've got both sides um, playing an undermining strategy now. Um, so if Black can get in this g4, that'll be thematic, undermining the pawn structure from f3. So here's Black's point. So it's a beautifully played King's engine, this. Um, so these knights have always been impressed by the sort of elegance of the knights. First of all, unblocking the pawns and then going back to occupy aggressive positions to further carry on the simple space gaining strategy on the, on the um, king side. But also, as a king's engine player myself, rook f7 is also a very nifty dual purpose move because it's protecting this entry point. But at the same time, after bishop f8, rook g7, the rook's um, also potentially helping in the attack with like, h4 and g4 later. So it's sort of defensive and attacking move, this rook f7. And bishop f8 is also useful because reinforcing the d6 pawn. Um, so black's fairly solid here on, on the queen side so far, and it's getting in this um, space gaining. But now we see a very interesting pawn sacrifice. Instead of uh, gs, that would be a bit too stereotypical. Here, black sees, but by sacrificing a pawn, gain access to some of the key dark squares, particularly like f4. So he sacrificed the whole pawn, and now, um, but first, instead of occupying f4, he's aiming to do something with this bishop. This bishop could be useful on this diagonal, especially now this white bishop's like trapped in the corner, so he can't parry that diagonal as easily. Uh, so that's exactly what happens. The bishop occupies a beautiful diagonal here. So instead of being like trapped behind the pawn chain, this bishop's very aggressive on this diagonal. And that's that's often a common theme in the king's engine to get this bishop on this diagonal, and then carry on with the king's side attack. So um, it's very instructive so far. Now you can see the pressure is building up on g-file and g2. Um, and why it's kind of passive, really, this queen side attack is, doesn't look too menacing at the moment. And even, even black is cheeky enough to play b5 here to stop even knight c4, which might harass the d6 pawn on this bishop. So that's even further slows down White's queenside um, initiative. Now we see this rook to coming to g7, so this g file is getting even more pressurised. And g2 in particular is now a major target, but as well as that, f3. So both these pawns are in, under intense scrutiny. And with this bishop here, you know, White's almost threatening knight f3, but if it, it was not for this bishop. Um, now Black plays bishop h3. So that's uh, stunningly leaving the, uh, the whole bishop and pre. Now what would happen here if g takes h3? Let's have a quick look. Um, well, there's a stunning continuation here, which is just simply sacrificing the queen. Bishop takes, rook takes, and after king h2, knight h3, mate. So, not a good idea to take that bishop. But now black's got one, two, three, four attack attacking units on this pawn, and also this pawn's attacked by two units. In fact, look at all of black's pieces. They're all aggressively placed. So this is not bad for the price of a pawn so far. White um, continues with queen e2, and now knight takes g2, forcefully um, ripping open the g line. Uh, so white's a spectator now. Bishop takes g2. Bishop takes g2, queen takes g2. Now, has black blundered? Because there's this rook protecting g2, so 
what was his intention to take here? No. He plays more devastatingly. Black plays a little move queen h4, exposing the rook to attack the queen. And the queen can't easily move back here. Say queen e2, knight g3. Um, so what is white doing here? Or queen f1, knight g3. So black is winning the queen. Black um, just recaptured here. So white was forced to give up the queen for rook. Check. King h8. It's all over really now. Black's got a material advantage and still this horrible attack. Knight one very passive. I mean, this is a very good advert for the king's engine so far because there was no real danger on the queen's side the way black played it. Knight f4, getting the knight even more aggressive. Um, rook g3. This is all fairly hopeless now. Bishop f2. So this diagonal is painful because this knight, if rook moves, that knight will be in pre. It's, it's just hopeless. It's just all gone. Um, now, rook g4, so... Queen h3 was played. So if the knight moves, queen takes f3. Just white cannot cope with this pressure here and material deficit. Knight d2. Now h5. Rook g5. And white actually resigned on his move to start playing rook g5. So that was quite a stunning King's Engine performance. A good advert for the opening, which became a lot more popular, especially after the annotations of this Zurich 1953 by Bronstein in his famous annotated games book. Brilliant game.